Well, uh, here I am again. Uh, we're con going to continue to work with uh, Rowan Williams' book, Meeting God and Paul. And um, we're at that um, part in Rowan's book where he starts talking about um, Paul's sense of what a lot of people would talk about uh, on morality, but there's much more to it than that. But this to start out with what the letters of Paul are trying to articulate is a new way of seeing and imagining God as a life of gift and mutuality and delight in Jesus. And so at this point in the book, it's in the third chapter, about two-thirds of the way through, um, we come to a point and we might be, probably start we might start stumbling over our ideas and notions of Paul as a high-minded moralist. Um, we can uh, often end up uh, getting hung up uh, seeing Paul as someone on a puritanical witch hunt. But the truth of the matter is that, that Paul is trying to communicate uh, a new law of life as expressed in the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And all of that stands in very stark contradistinction to the social and cultural norms of the Greco-Roman influences in and around the Mediterranean. It was, uh, I guess it was about three or four weeks ago, uh, one of our parishioners, uh, who was also going to work with me um, and, and teaching uh, Rowan's book, or at least having a facilitating a class about it, uh, we were talking about how we were going to continue doing this, and her name is Sharon Irvine, and she brought to my attention a book which she had purchased, and it was titled Paul Among the People. And it's by Sarah Rudin. And uh, she is a scholar in classical languages, and she's educated at the University of Michigan, John Hopkins, and Harvard. And she has translated five books of classical literature, uh, the Aeneid being one of them. And that book, and I highly recommend it to you, if you want to get a, a much deeper understanding of the context and the social and cultural milieu that Paul finds himself throughout the Mediterranean. This is an excellent book, Paul Among the People. And what she does is she goes back through, here's a person who taught the classics, but she went back through and found a, uh, an interesting parallel in the, the, the Greek that Paul writes in and the ancient, her ancient classics. And she started looking at the text of the ancient classics and looking and determining the kind of cultural understanding that the people had in that day and time and what Paul was really kind of up against. That's just a whole lot, uh, there's a whole lot more to it uh, than I can possibly even go into detail on. Uh, but I, she's much smarter than I am about these things and I think she would really give you some very fine insights into some of the language that Paul uses and why he uses that language and why he uses some of the words he uses because of the type of historical cultural he finds himself in. And it's very important. If you can get that book and read it, I promise you it'll be an eye-opener. Some of it's kind of on the risque side, but she is, um, she is giving us an example of the type of literature that was available and what the people would normally hear. So I want to recommend that book to you. But let's, let's move along a little bit. For Paul, morality is about the manifestation of a good life. Uh, a life that shows forth the glory, the delight, and the service, the attention, the generosity that God has made to dwell in community. So when he uses certain words and they kind of rub up against us, there's two things that are going on. One, we don't really understand what that meant until we do some research, at least I didn't, uh, in, in the context in which she was speaking. And the other, as <clears throat> the other aspect of it is trying to help the, the, the fledgling church, the beginning churches around the Mediterranean, to, to live into a different way of their religious life and understanding of God than has ever been uh, articulated before them. It's just totally different. 
And so Paul is, has a real love, I mean, a real love for the community of, of the people because he has to deal, not only does he talk about a lot of things that are just very, very difficult for the people to understand, but he keeps pushing on that and keeps loving them and keeps staying with them. So for Paul, the question that needed to be asked are about what are those characteristics and attitudes that lead to building up the followers of Christ Jesus? What are the very concrete ways we are to live our lives which are life-giving, they contribute to wholeness, or those activities and actions that actually lead to separation, sickness, and dysfunction? And Paul can be very specific about these matters, but it is specific so that it can distinguish between what promotes mutuality and wholeness and which is the divine life from what deepens and, and what, what, what promotes the divine life, what deepens that, and the opposite of that, that what deepens animosity and strife and self-centeredness. And once again, if we can just spend some time reading about the cultural milieu in which Paul finds himself, I think you'll be amazingly surprised, amazingly surprised at the differences um, from our understanding and, the, and, and uh, what Paul was having to literally deal with. So in the letter to Galatians, for example, in, in chapter 5, uh, 19 through 26, Paul lists and admonishes the people about various specific behaviors and characteristics. And I think we so often tend to focus on those words that might point at sexuality. But the biggest portion of the text mentions things like disputes, outbursts of anger, dissensions, factions, envy, boastfulness, and challenging. And what he means by challenging is trying to dominate. Have, have power over and above. And so what Rowan says in, in, in his book, I'm quoting here, is that life in the flesh is life of people closed off from one another. Life in the flesh is a life, is a life of people closed off from one another. Now I've heard it said, and it, it, it rings true to, to I think a large extent, that if we were to substitute flesh with our word ego and see where that takes us when we read the letters of Paul, instead of um, thinking of the human body or the human flesh as being bad or evil, what if we were to substitute ego in its place and the way we think about ourselves? And there's got to be a healthy ego. I mean, there's, there's an aspect of a healthy ego, but there's also the shadow side of the ego, which causes a lot of pain and suffering, not only to oneself, but to everyone else around them, depending upon the level of power and authority that they have. So, Rowan here, let me back up. Rowan says, life in the flesh is life is a life of people closed off from one another, while life in the spirit is a life of people who are opened up to one another. Hugely different. Hugely different. And when I have to sacrifice and learn um, to operate out of a dist different system than my egoic system, as uh, Cynthia or Bourgeau says, when I have to operate out of a different system, then with the grace of God working in me, I can move into that life of the Spirit. Because I'm not trying to control or compete. I'm not trying to profit from. I don't have, the, I don't have to be right. I don't have to always win. So those, those are some of the things, and I think it's a really good quote that Rowan throws in his book there. But we are all like Paul in that we do need to delineate between what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior, and the behavior that leads to, to spirit-led spirit -led mutuality, maturity, and humility before others. Uh, and the truth of the matter is if we go back and uh, look at Paul's writing. He just keeps talking about that over and over again. He may be using some different words, but basically he keeps saying the same thing over and over again in his letters. But throughout Paul's letter, he spends a lot of words also trying to get us to understand that we are all broken. This notion of humility that Paul keeps hammering throughout the, all his letters is, 
that no one is better or more deserving than another. Our race, our citizenship, our social status, or even our religious works cannot earn us God's love or favor. We, we, we already have such love and favor, and all of which, Paul says, is the grace of God. Uh, I've heard it said by, um, I think it was Father Rohr in one of his books, where he says, uh, when it comes to our relationship and the love of God, you can't get there. You can only be there. And so Paul is talking, writing to a group of people whose religion and religiosity was all about striving and begging and bargaining with deities and being at the whim of some kind of fate that the deity would or would not have for them that would either please or not please them. I mean, carrying that kind of burden and that tension around. Uh, so Paul is hitting them with things that just are absolutely, if you want to be honest with you about it, on a spiritual level, quite liberating, if you can, if you can follow into that and believe that. So Paul always goes on to say that our prestige, our possessions, or any sense of power are all just an illusion, and they're impermanent. They are, they are fading away. And so what is eternal, Paul lists in Galatians, is <clears throat> love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are characteristics of um, a mature spirituality or one moving into mature spirituality. Uh, it, it was some time ago uh, I was having a conversation with somebody. I don't, I don't even remember who it was. But uh, I was talking about, you know, growing up and being mature in, in Christ. And it's just so interesting because we talk about uh, physical development and mental development. You know, we, t we talk about emotional development. But very rarely, very rarely do we ever talk about spiritual development. And we don't really like to go there because it can tend to, people want to get puffed up. And we can send, tend to lose a sense of humility if we start thinking that we are somewhere. But the truth of the matter is um, we all are on a journey in different levels and different stages. <clears throat> and so Paul is really interested when he writes these letters to a lot of his congregations is about growing up spiritually uh, and, and what that looks like. But a person asked me a question, so Alan, what do you think spiritual maturity is? And I said, I think spiritual maturity is when we can get to that point where we can let go of our ego. We can just let go of our ego and be who we deeply are. We can be what is permanent and not temporal or illusionary. And so that is, and that's a process. That's a growth process. Rowan talks about that. Paul talks about that. It's a growth process that we all engage in. So <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to close with um, a, a quote I read from another Rowan Williams book I went back and was looking over. And the, the book that Rowan uh, wrote is called The Wound of Knowledge. And here again, it's another one I highly recommend to you. Um, and so this is a quote from that book I want to I'll leave you with, and then I'll leave you with one question. Rowan says this, the new, life, the new life is not a possession. It is simply new life. That is to say, a new world of possibilities, a new future, which is to be constructed day by day. Life, after all, implies movement and growth. And perhaps this rather banal and obvious point is an indicator of what must be central for our adequate understanding of Christian spirituality. It is worth noting how much stress not only Paul but other writers lay upon the themes of the call to maturity and the risks of regression. Salvation is to be realized in growth, and not to grow is to fall away. So, in the context of everything I've been talking about, this is what Paul is trying to teach uh, and preach to his, the people in his various letters. So, question I have in, in this little discussion, what do you make 
of the distinction between living by the flesh and living by the Spirit. Thank you.